Kathy, thank you so much. Uh, I consider this a big privilege to be able to speak to the Colorado Tour Tourism Ministry. Uh, thanks to you and Secretary Markey, the governor and his staff for inviting me. I grew up in Colorado in Fort Collins. The chance to speak to the people of my home state um, in an industry for which I've spent 30 years uh, in travel marketing is just a real thrill. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to be here. I spent a lot of days, both winter and summer, in Steamboat. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite spots on earth. So I thought for today's presentation, let's put back the backdrop of Steamboat and, and maybe pretend like we're there. And hopefully as I take you through the presentation today, we can all put ourselves in that idyllic space uh, in Steamboat Springs and on the mountain in Steamboat. And in fact, you know, maybe it's a better idea to do the real thing. I don't know if you're tired of being in virtual environments. I'm probably a little bit tired of giving uh, Zoom presentations with a fake backdrop. So I think maybe we'll try something a little bit different today. Why don't we do the real thing? Why don't we try something that's actually from Steamboat? And I, you know, I wanna thank Rob Perlman and his team in Steamboat for actually making it possible for us to be in Steamboat. I wanna mention, I don't have a mask on right now. Um, I'm gonna keep proper, properly social distance from everybody. The crew who's shooting me here in this beautiful space actually does have masks on. Chris and Dustin are perfectly masked up. Um, but we thought this would be a great opportunity to talk to you about the changing world of travel um, and a chance to talk from one of the best places in the state and how we see things happening. Um, so what we'd like to talk about today are probably the key issues of the day. We've got a 100-year pandemic, um, things that have changed our world entirely. What does recovery look like? How do we want to think about recovery? What is, what is the timing of that recovery? And then lastly, what are some of the major things changing with consumers? What are some long-term effects? What are some short-term effects? How might we expect things to change? Th this notion that is a 100-year pandemic is probably right. There's been a little bit of a narrative spun up that every 100 years we have something like this happen. I'm not sure that's necessarily accurate as this slide suggests. I'm not sure the plague and cholera were necessarily the same thing. In today's environment, we have global narratives that are being perpetuated with media and social media that have turned what is a very serious health crisis into a larger social crisis. And that has had a dramatic effect on the way we do business. Coronavirus has actually been the second most used word on the internet since April. The only word that's been used more in that time is the word people. 60 million people in the United States have been either directly or indirectly affected by coronavirus from a health standpoint. And th th that's uh, hard to understand. That's just in the United States. $1.3 trillion has been trimmed off from the travel economy. This is the second largest uh, industry in the world that has been at the front end of the coronavirus crisis. We believe it'll be lead the front end of the recovery, but certainly from a jobs perspective and a revenue perspective, that revenue reduction travels born the brunt of a lot of it. You know, before we go any further, I, th I think we should take a chance to appreciate where we are. Um, the village is gonna be electric tomorrow when they bring everybody in, but preparing for, uh, the destination and, and the people who are actually still traveling to come up to, to uh, Steamboat. I wanna talk about what we think is really important to how travel recovers, and that's these four phases of fear, understanding, action, and rational behavior. We were really in a fear stage as people were trying and grappling with what coronavirus was. We actually believe we've emerged a little bit from fear and are starting to move into more of an understanding and rational behavior phase at the moment. And when you think about the fact that the travel industry globally is a $10 trillion industry, that it is the 10% of the global GDP, and it is three times larger than agriculture. As I said earlier, it's really important that as we emerge from the virus, that travel lead out a recovery, financially, economically, and otherwise. This is a look at uh, how the travel forecast has come to pass. 19, where we did well over a trillion dollars in the United States in travel spending, has dropped well below that to over, just over $600 billion. That means uh, jobs, that means livelihoods, and this is also a look at how that recovery might happen going forward. I think, um, as I said earlier, travel should lead out this recovery, and we're actually a lot more optimistic than these numbers would suggest from U.S. travel. That in fact, we might see recovery happen a little bit more quickly. So what does travel recovery look like? Well, let's start with the fact that it clearly turned our lives upside down. Uh, besides the fact that all of us now recognize that we have bad breath and maybe brush our teeth a little bit more, there have also been some really interesting 
changes in the way we do things. Telemedicine's taken off. Bike sales have never been higher. People are working from home at the historically high rates and changing the way in which their time is being used. Some of those things are probably long-term changes. Some of them aren't. Are people going to continue to only work out from home as opposed to work out in a gym with their friends and family? I doubt it. These are some of the things we've looked at actually in terms of what will change. There's some little bit of scary things that people are changing about their own behavior, specifically uh, how much they shower. Uh, you see here they, they actually are changing their eating habits. I would suggest that's more about drinking habits. Liquor sales are at all-time highs. People are drinking more than ever before through this virus. But if you look at the bottom of this chart, you'll see that travel is one of the most impacted elements in terms of behaviors that are going to change and that are changing now. We think that could pivot again. But also that some of these long-term changes are going to happen. I think it's very possible that we will continue to have different kinds of border controls, that we will continue to look at clean as safety pervasively from here on out. That may, that may never change. I also think there's some technologies that have come to pass, touchless service, for example, or QSR codes for menus. I think those things are probably here to stay. And that's, I think, a good thing broadly, and the things that will benefit, um, benefit us all in the long term. The other thing I'd like to mention is that the MMGY intelligence travel research team really felt like we were heading into our travel recession as early as uh, October of 2019, some of the early signs of that recession. And coronavirus is in no way a good thing, but we do think the fact that this steep, steep decline in travel does give permission for travel to come back more quickly than it might otherwise have been through a slow slog recession. And we're hopeful because, again, travel is such a huge economic uh, indicator and because it is 10% of global GDP that w it will lead out a recovery. But I want to talk about this for just a moment, that this recovery is absolutely a recovery of two different groups, the haves and the have-nots. It would be a mistake not to talk about the fact that small business bankruptcies are up 27% year on year, that one in three households have either missed or are late on a mortgage or rent payment. There are people hurting in the U.S. economy. At the same time, the stock market has historic highs. People who had wealth have more wealth, have more wherewithal. And, and beyond making a social statement about that, I think it's important as travel marketers, as people in the travel industry, to understand that different pockets of people will have the ability to travel going forward than might have otherwise been able to. So let's talk about that travel demand and what it looks like. We're going to pull from data that we call the portrait of the American travelers. We're also going to pull from tra uh, data from uh, an ongoing survey we're doing monthly to measure travel sentiment. And I, and I want to start with this, um, the Traveler Sentiment in Index. This is an historic look at, and I'm going to take a seat actually. You guys don't care if I take a seat, do you? Good. We're Creekside, why not? And we're going to talk about some pretty heavy, heavy stuff. So this is a historic look from 2007 at travel sentiment. And you can see in 2016, we hit a high. We've now hit the very lowest point, in fact, since 9-11. And so we have a long way to come back in terms of travel sentiment. If you look at US travel data around the revenues, you can see a steep decline in 20, and then again, a slow incline back in out years that we think we could actually outperform. And it's a tale of two travel economies, people who are traveling by car, 72% of people in our last travel survey said they felt safest in their car. That isn't necessarily true. In fact, air travel is actually safer broadly, but people want to be in control of their environment. They want an opportunity to um, choose who they interact with. They want to go to wide open spaces and can do that in their car. So we, we would suggest that that kind of travel will continue. The average road trip for travel in today's corona, uh, coronavirus environment is 395 miles. It's slowly growing, but people still want to take shorter trips with people they know to places they are familiar with because it's all about control in today's environment. The other part of the travel economy is corporate travel. That is in a different place. We expect several years before full-on corporate travel returns because conventions and whole-on corporate travel will be slow to re recover and corporations may have a harder time funding travel that they were before. We expect unmanaged travel, some smaller pieces of the corporate travel community, maybe some Smurf group to return, but we do think it's going to take a little bit while longer to get corporate travel going. And then in terms of what this looks like from a recovery standpoint, 
you know, leisure travel is going to recover um, starting in our own neighborhoods. We saw lots of people vacationing in their own communities in the early stages of coronavirus. We now see people moving out a little bit into states or regional areas, and eventually they will travel long haul and they will travel international. We expect that to take 12 months. On the corporate side, again, as I pointed out, we see very slow recoveries for large citywide group conventions, but we do think some of the logistical travel associated with the virus or food or other types of services like that will begin to help commercial travel. And in fact, this week, U.S. occupancies have gone above 50% for the first time since coronavirus hit. I think before we go on, I might uh, enjoy just a, a cocktail. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in Steamboat, they're incredibly well known um, for uh, the, the Bloody Marys. And if I'm going to be here, I think I should take the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so it's much. Very nice of you to do that. Enjoy your stay. Cheers. This sort of goes to my point about um, communication in this environment. I'm sitting out away from Christina, who stayed six feet away from me and served me a cocktail. I can still enjoy this, which I, I may, may do at a later time. But this notion that we can now begin to uh, evolve into the way we have travel experience is a very real thing. And so let me talk about the airline industry for a second. First of all, um, low-cost carriers in June began to do very well. Frontier, Spirit, Southwest started to grow load factors into the 70% range on reduced capacity. Then when the narrative of the virus switched over and became more negative in July, July and early August, we saw some of those uh, load factors come back down. But the first point I'd make about that is that people will pivot quickly and we expect as the narrative evolves, they'll begin to get on planes again in larger numbers. The other thing I would tell you is the airlines are banking on demand in the fall. Southwest Airlines just announced nonstop service into Steamboat via Hayden. Southwest is out in the market right now with fare deals for September and October. And in fact, the MMGY intelligence team has labeled this recovery the stretch season because we believe a lot of summer demand is actually moving into the fall and will materialize in historic fall travel, primarily by car, but perhaps by plane as well. You know, the other thing I want to talk about as we move on is this notion that travel is more than just um, a process. We think that this notion of emotional intelligence, especially when it comes to corporate travel and commercial travel, is really important. People will want to meet again. People want to get on the road again. And emotional intelligence is something you just cannot convey on a Zoom call. Um, and, and we think that will tip over again to drive more travel. And even when it comes to leisure, we know that traveling is a uh, human wellness issue that well-being is supported by travel. It creates empathy, it creates bridges of understanding, it creates wellness. And we know that travel is a, is, will, will continue to be that for travelers, and as soon as they can, they will get out and travel more. I alluded to just a minute ago that um, in June, we started seeing in our intent surveys really nice intent to start traveling again. And then that tipped down, as you can see from this chart, in late July. The good news is, is enrolling infection rates have begun to decline again across the United States and around the world. We're seeing intent grow again. And as I pointed out earlier, it's, a, a, I guess, a tip to the fact that when people start to see that the, it's getting better, one of the first things they want to do is travel. This is a look at uh, what people feel safe doing. And in fact, um, there are a lot of things outdoors that people want to do before they'll do indoors. And you can see from this chart, there's still people don't feel safe at places like indoor sporting events or indoor concerts, but they increasingly feel safe being in outdoor environments like Steamboat. And even in these other venues, we see some, see some confidence beginning to tip up. I also want to talk about some data from Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank looked at pe what people will say they do over the next one, two, and three months. And in fact, um, many things like concerts, uh, indoor activities were something they said they wouldn't do. And all these things include travel, the things you can see on the chart. But one of the things I want to point out specifically from the Deutsche Bank data is that there was a very large percentage of people who weren't sure what they would yet do. And we would argue that those people are the ones that wait and then book on very short booking periods and will drive demand quickly and especially in the fall. I think before we go into the gondola house and get on the gondola, I will put uh, my mask on because I think that's the rule here. Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, one of the things we know that is important in terms of how travel will recover is this notion of safety. So um, everybody's putting in new safety procedures. The hotel industry is partnering with brands like Clorox 
um, the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, to create safe programs to make people feel like the protocols are in place. And we're actually seeing in the data that travel providers are becoming more confident in conveying that safety and travelers are beginning to become more confident in what they can and cannot do when they travel. I want to point out another issue that's not talked about a lot and that is relative to workers in the hospitality and service industry. Many of you watching this have smaller attractions or destinations that rely on hospitality workers. In 2019, H1B visa denials were actually at all time highs and we now have a great number of people leaving the workforce who are going to have to be retrained. And we think that's actually a very serious issue for the travel industry and something we should be talking about. All right, let's talk about uh, the need to understand travelers. I think when we think about recovery and we talk about the people who will travel and who won't, I think a lot of people have suggested that this person, the millennial, this guy is a millennial. And the narrative goes that he will spend a lot of money on travel and he will drive a recovery in the travel industry. The truth is, millennials are now age 23 to 41. They are not the guy you just saw. And in fact, they're increasingly a very different group of people. Let's, let's, get, on the, let's get on the gondola. Ah, much better. On the way up to the top of the mountain. Um, so when we talk about millennials, we have to recognize there's been a false narrative and a stereotype applied to millennials. And I'll give you an example. They've been paid, pegged as the avocado toast generation, that they're willing to spend a lot of money on, on appetizers. The truth is the millennial cohort spends 50% of what baby boomers did at the same time at the same age. They're only 25% of leisure spending in the United States. And in fact, over time, they've been spending less on travel. So this notion that they actually have a lot of money or in spending it on travel or that they're taking exotic, exotic vacations, sleeping on the jungles of Brazil and then spending money to take business class uh, back to the United States is just not true. Scott Galloway, who's one of my favorite uh, thinkers, talks about this readily, that though we think they have a lot of money, they actually aren't spending it. And our research supports that. If you look at travel spending in the millennial cohort over the last several years, you see that has continued to decline. And in fact, no longer are they the spending power in certain uh, areas of that cohort than they were in the past. And guess what? On the heels of millennials comes the next generation, Gen Z or screenagers. Uh, this group of uh, people is age 14 to 21. They are sorry, age 11 to 21. They're actually being labeled as pluralis pluralists. They uh, spend too much time on their screens. They don't trust anybody. They don't read. Um, again, ridiculous stereotypes that we tend to apply to this broad swath of people. Millennials and Gen Zs are 80 and 70 million people respectively in the United States alone and we try to paint them with a broad brush. And before you look, now we have Generation Alpha or Gen A. These are individuals who were born in 2010 and those who will still be born for four more years. There are some interesting characteristics about this group. They will have the widest wealth disparity in the history of the United States as they grow older. They will have the highest percentage of foreign born parents of any generation before them. Those are real things to pay attention to. But there are also a lot of stereotypes being applied to them. And my favorite is that four in five of them like to make things with slime. Um, very relevant, of course. But I think, I think this is what I'm trying to get at is that instead of applying broad brushes to generations or large cohorts of people, let's try to understand better who travelers are and who key audiences are based on what we do in our own attraction, our own destination, our own hotel. This is Herb Kelleher. I think one of the greatest innovators in travel history. Of course, he started Southwest Airlines. Unfortunately, he died last year. So in some ways, this is my homage to him. Herb Kelleher probably changed air travel more than anyone has in the history of our travel industry. I think you all know who this is, Governor Hickenlooper. This is Candace Nelson. She's uh, considered to be the cupcake queen. She started Sprinkles and is, is now one of the biggest cupcake magnets in the United States. Um, I think you know who this is. And we probably should start to feel sorry for Bill Belichick now that Tom Brady's not there anymore. Um, Lynn manuel Miranda, I know it's hard to get tickets in Denver for Hamilton, but obviously a cultural genius. And one of these guys is my son. You can probably figure out which one. But my question is, what do all these people have in common? I mean, you couldn't find a group of people more different. A football coach, a cupcake queen, an airline executive, and a, a young kid in my family. 
Very, very different, very different lifestyles, very different interests. But did you know that they all went to the same university, Wesleyan University? <clears throat> and if you look into the data, you'll find out that where you go to college actually dictates more where you will travel on vacation as an adult than many other factors. For this group, they're more likely to go to the same place because they went to the same college, more so than where they live today, who their friends are today, and some of their other lifestyle interests. And I think it's an example of how data can be really interesting if you dig into it. I give you the Symphony of the Seas, a $1.3 billion cruise ship built by Royal Caribbean. This cruise ship has a Legoland, a skating rink, a climbing wall, 14 themed restaurants, a putt-putt, a wave pool, and it was entirely built on the backs of one audience, one specific segment, and that's millennial families. That's an example of a travel brand looking at a very lucrative market in a very specific way, older millennials with kids in their household, and building a product and a marketing program around that. I want to text, talk next about the fact that nobody really trusts us in marketing. In fact, almost 8 out of 10 in our travel survey tell us they distrust what travel marketers tell us about the product itself, about the experience, and about rates and fares. This is because for a long time we in the travel industry have created sort of a frenetic marketplace. The other thing we're finding out in the midst of coronavirus is that <clears throat> nearly 9 in 10 people don't trust others to handle the virus properly. And interestingly, if you look at this last factoid, over half of travelers actually judge people for traveling today. And I'll talk a moment about, in a moment about travel shaming, which we think is actually a very real issue, uh, especially in the United States. We expect a renaissance in advertising that's coming very soon. In 2022, cookies will no longer be a technology that will be allowed to be used in marketing. Cookies are a way for marketers to track you and your online behavior. They will be banned starting in 2022, and it means an entirely new way for marketers to out reach out to their customers. In fact, I'm going to hearken back to Aristotle and his three pillars of the power of persuasion. This idea that ethos, pathos, and logos are the way you really move opinion. Um, this idea that you have to build credibility, an emotional bond, and a logical reason for buying a product. And to me, as we no longer can use cookie technology and this idea of just inundating people with offers after offers after offers tied to their web behavior, we're actually going to come back to the brand and we're going to come back to a narrative to, to use Aristotle's principle. That we're going to have to convince people to give us permission to talk to them, to give us permission to market to them. And I think that's going to be a very powerful change in advertising and marketing going forward. Let's also remember that people are on screens more than ever. On average, over 12 hours a day, we are on a laptop, a desktop, a tablet, a phone, or a television screen. 12 hours a day, five hours a day on our mobile device. So the way in which we interact with content is increasingly digital, increasingly frenetic, and the screen time, especially in the midst of COVID, is higher than it's ever been before. I also think it's important for us all to remember and be empathetic to what's happening in households today. People are spending more time at home. Many people call it home quarantine even when they don't have the virus. They're being asked to work from home. They're being asked to operate their households in new ways. Maybe they're taking care of someone who can't take care of themselves right now or they're educating their children because their children can't be in schools. I think this notion from an advertising and marketing standpoint that we have to be sensitive to that is incredibly important. And we actually think there's something happening in the industry that's interesting to look at. We're calling it work from vacation, uh, WFV. We actually think learn from vacation is a real thing too, as kids in tow with their parents going to places away from where they live in a vacation destination and working and learning. We see this in the data. For example, um, extended stay hotels are actually outperforming other categories of the hotel space because people are taking these trips and setting up work. We also know that programs from Hyatt, the country of Bermuda, um, MGM Grand Resorts, where they're encouraging people to come to their destinations and work there and actually providing them incentives. So as you think about your own environment, think about work from vacation as a real thing. Let's talk about who's going to influence travel going forward, both in the midst of coronavirus and as we come out of it. I'd like to say to you that I believe the OTAs, or specifically booking, Expedia, Airbnb, and others are going to be more important in this environment. It's going to be harder to drive revenue. OTAs have a massive marketing spend, 
And in these kinds of environments, in crisis environments, we typically see people look for aggregators, for OTAs, for information, so they can look at one place for the best fares or the best information. So expect OTAs to actually do well in this environment. And then the question we ask ourselves, is somebody going to become the tender of travel? Can somebody really become that app that steers us all into travel behavior? And, and I think the carry-on point to that is, is this environment allow some small startups to get pervasive in travel, or is this going to be now the province of just the big guys? We tend to lean, uh, lean more toward the big guys, and I'll give you some examples. Microsoft, who, as you may know, is also trying to buy TikTok in the social space, has a product called Xios, 600 million users in Asia. It translates in Mandarin to little ice. It is a personal concierge, a virtual personal concierge. And when you look at the data, we're finding that people are actually more loyal to that personal concierge than they are to actual brands. And Microsoft is gambling a lot on this notion that you will use your personal device and your virtual assistant to make a lot of your decisions going forward. Alibaba, the largest player in the world, not only has a travel brand called Fliggy, which is incredibly pervasive uh, in Asia, but they are all now also now building a financial model around Ant Financial, which is tying everything into their financial platforms. And in fact, they're starting to roll that out in the United States. So I think Alibaba is a major player coming forward. Google. Google has just stood up Google Reserve, which is a um, tour operator and itinerary builder that they're going to compete with their, on their own. They're also what Focuswire calls a super app of travel. A billion YouTube views a day. They produce more than 10 times what Yelp does in terms of travel and restaurant reviews. Two times the number of influencers around travel than Facebook does. They are the pervasive player in travel and in fact, Consumer travelers tell us that Google, they consider Google the most objective arbiter when trying to make decisions around travel. So we know Google is probably here to stay for a long time in travel. And despite the fact that Mark Zuckerberg continues to be dragged up to Capitol Hill to defend the Facebook model, Facebook continues to grow. And in fact, their advertising models continue to outperform most every other one. Uh, even with our own practice in travel marketing, we see Facebook perform very well. And when you look at the data, you'll see that Google and Facebook together are 61% of all ad spending, digital ad spending. And we know that social media continues to be an influence. A lot of people are influenced by their friends and family and others they don't even know online to make travel decisions. And celebrities in particular continue to influence people and the types of travel decisions they're going to make going forward. And you see a lot of those people, like Jessica Alba, for example, really leaning into travel and influencing others that follow her into what kind of travel is appropriate and what kind of travel is interesting. User-generated content through platforms like TikTok continues to become more important in travel. The growth of TikTok has been unbelievable, and the amount of travel content that people are posting with video is increasingly becoming an influence on the decisions we make around travel. And I'm sure many of you are posting TikTok videos. But I do want to talk about this notion of travel shaming, which I mentioned earlier. The New York Times has written about this. A lot of people are now traveling, and we know that communities in beaches and mountain locations in wide open national parks are actually seeing very good volumes. But many people who are traveling into those venues are not sharing it because they're fearful that others are going to judge them for traveling in the midst of the, uh, the coronavirus. And we find that a behavior that will probably shift over time but interesting nonetheless, and something to pay attention to as a marketer. I want to talk about Amazon. Amazon has Amazon Prime. They have the most programmatic data about the things we buy. They have the ability to stand up commerce around anything and have done sporting goods, groceries, pharmacy. So why not travel? And especially when you consider how much money Jeff Bezos has and how he can use that money. Bezos, with his wealth, could buy every team in the NFL, the top three European soccer teams, which is up for debate. I think it's Bayern Munich, and I think it's Manchester City. A lot of people, a lot of emotion around that. He could then take his new girlfriend to a movie premiere after buying a large movie company in Ferrari, in a Ferrari, because he purchased Ferrari and then have about $12 billion left over for popcorn. So you can see that Bezos really has the money to do it. I think that's just an incredible stat. But also when you look at Amazon Prime users, there are more Amazon Prime members than people who decorate a Christmas tree. It's just incredible how much power they have in the marketplace. And we believe travel is the next great landscape for them to engage. And in fact, we're seeing in India, Amazon starting to stand up airfares on their marketplace as a test. 
So we would not be surprised if Amazon weighs in very soon on the travel industry, and as a result, players like Expedia and Booking and Google will have to respond in new ways. Remember, Amazon sells a lot of inventory in all industries they work in at very low margins, which puts in peril some of the other merchant models in the travel industry. And I think a lot of people in travel on the supplier side would love for Amazon to come in because they might see it as a lower cost distribution channel. I want to talk about branding. I think more than ever, branding is important. And maybe for customers, both in the midst of coronavirus and as we come out of coronavirus, branding will be more important than ever. And this is from Tim Cook at, at Apple. Branding and brand empathy have never been as, as important as they are today. And I think that's in part because you have to set a tone of empathy. As I said earlier, people are in very difficult circumstances in some cases, and if they're not difficult circumstances, they're in different circumstances. And brands have to be empathetic to that. I'm going to give you a little cautionary tale. Emirates Airlines, one of the highest end airlines in the world out of Dubai, a uh, major route carrier around the world, actually stood up a coronavirus insurance policy to try to create some confidence with their travelers. They suggested that when you fly on Emirates, we'll give you a free travel insurance policy in case you get sick. But what happened was the media picked up on the fact that there was a small provision in that policy that if you died, Emirates would cover your funeral. And that ended up being played out in the media, which obviously became a very negative piece around coronavirus and the risk that you might take when you fly. By the way, Ed Bastian of Delta says that you're nine times safer on an airplane than you are in the grocery store. So uh, just putting that out there for those of you who think about air travel going forward. In a Harris poll, we know that the brands that are now considered safe and successful are brands around clean, like Clorox, comfort foods like Hershey's chocolate, and around e-commerce. And Amazon obviously is the giant. I'm sure all of you see those Amazon trucks all the time. And then the brands coming out of coronavirus that are actually growing. Zoom has actually become a generic term now for online meetings, even though there are a number of other platforms from Google and Microsoft. You see SpaceX continuing to thrive in this environment. TikTok, as I mentioned earlier, Instacart, and Headspace around uh, healthcare, self-care. So there are brands doing well in a coronavirus, uh, probably better than the travel industry is right now. I also want to talk about the fact that 6% of U.S. consumers are now in some form have protested and are weighing in on social justice. I think all of us have to be in tune to the things changing around social justice and equal treatment. Uh, MMGY Global, in fact, will be standing up a study on the black traveler community here shortly because we think it's important for all of us to begin to understand better the concerns of all travelers and especially underrepresented communities. But consumers are absolutely paying attention to this, and as a brand, you have to weigh in. I would say the NBA has done the very best job of this. They are full-throated in their support of Black Lives Matter and equal justice, and as a brand, they know, based on who their customer is and who their constituents are, that they have to weigh in. All right, we're getting off the gondola. Awesome. Let me put my uh, mask back on as we greet some uh, people up here at the top of the mountain. Hi, guys. How's it going? Yeah, Thank you very much. You Beautiful views, as usual. But I'm talking about the NBA, and I think a really good example of a brand that understands itself and understands how, in this case, to think about social justice as a mainstay of what their brand is. And I think no matter what your brand is, big or small, understanding those kinds of things is incredibly important. I also want to talk about the importance of local branding. This is an example from Singapore. They're actually doing a lot of branding locally with influencers who live in their communities. This is a skateboarder who's influencing others who like outdoor activities and who can come to Singapore to do that. This is an example of really thinking local as a brand yourself and what kind of influencers you can uh, involve in your branding. Even Diddy, who's Uber's main competitor, is building their brand in China at a local level connecting drivers to communities, connecting passengers to drivers in a very different way than Uber's doing it. And it's more of a look at branding on a local basis. And I, I take this opportunity to really credit the Colorado Tourism Office for developing incredibly good local co-op programs that allow everyone who's watching this to take advantage of local branding and taking your brand and applying it to the equity that Colorado has created as a broad brand. And then the last item I talk about branding today is around this notion of sustainability. We know from our surveys that people still care about the environment, that they place a premium on brands that show social purpose, that want to lean into the environment and want to show that they care about uh, so social and environmental issues.
JetBlue, for example, has vowed to be the first carbon neutral airline in the United States based on that promise and the promise that their uh, industry and their customers expect that. I want to close today with the fact that it took us 22 minutes to come up the gondola today. In that time, 80,000 people around the world took a trip. The travel industry is the most powerful industry in the world for economic opportunity, for empathy building, for creating bridges to other cultures, and for leading a recovery in a global economy that desperately needs it. And we in Colorado are lucky to have this kind of backdrop and all the backdrops that you enjoy around the state as a way to help drive that recovery. And I'm excited about being a part of that and really privileged again to have been here with you today. I hope this wasn't too clunky, that you enjoyed the opportunity to see some views in Steamboat. We're gonna, we're gonna now uh, jump into a question and answer opportunity. We've asked some people around the state to join us for a question and answer. So allowing them to, to uh, pull a few things and then I'll, I'll attempt to answer those questions. No better place to take some questions from around the state than between Sunshine Peak and Storm Peak up here at, at Steamboat Mountain um, and try to get a feel for how everybody's thinking around the state. Hi Clayton, it's Lisa Langer from Visit Glenwood Springs, poolside at Iron Mountain Hot Springs. With the wellness theme in mind, how can we help local businesses develop more activities and events focused on wellness travel? Hi Lisa, you know I would expect a question from you around therapeutic, that makes sense for, the, for Glenwood Springs. Um, we believe that the aging travel population, specifically around matures and baby boomers, makes therapeutic travel and particularly wellness travel incredibly viable, especially for a destination like Glenwood Springs and anybody in the state who's looking to attract that traveler, and especially coming out of coronavirus where safety and wellness I think will have a heightened purpose, that's a great place to be. Our guided tour is likely to increase in importance as Colorado opens again uh, to international markets, uh, seeing how the borders are currently closed. Sid, this is uh, actually a really important question because the first instinct would be that tours of groups is going to be less likely because people are trying not to be in larger groups. But we actually think that safety protocols are going to allow tour operators to bring in groups in a curated way and crucial, especially as we grow back the international market for tour operators inbound in Colorado. My name is Angelica Daniel. I'm the chief curator here at the Denver Art Museum. Clayton, I have a question for you. Are cities at a disadvantage in the recovery and attracting visitors if travelers consider urban areas higher risk? Hi, Angelica. Yeah, thanks. First of all, Denver Art Museum, one of my favorite places. Um, I think urban markets are a little bit harder right now. Uh, cities, because of the, the number of people, because of mass transportation, just aren't right now in our surveys the first choice. But I do think people will come into the cities from a leisure standpoint before they will come into for a corporate, from a corporate standpoint. And I also think attractions like museums are going to be in the middle of the first traveler audiences, specifically baby boomers and matures, who are telling us in our surveys that they do want to travel, and in fact, typically index higher to museums like the Denver Art Museum. Clayton, I happen to know this is your hometown. We're excited to say hello from Fort Collins. I'm Cynthia Eichler, President and CEO of Visit Fort Collins. Our question for you today, is over-tourism still a concern for travelers? And how is that impacted by marketing? Ah, Cynthia, old town, miss it a lot. Actually, I'll be there here shortly. Uh, thanks for the question. Actually, there are parts of the country where over-tourism continues to be an issue, and in specifically in some state and national parks, where people have indicated they are still traveling. Um, and I, but I actually think this is giving a pause. You read a lot about certain parts of the world where fewer tourists are permitting uh, sustainable environments to recover. So I do think that's giving a lot of destinations who have been overused, you know, we talk about tourism management, giving them a chance to breathe a little bit. But I do expect, especially from a leisure standpoint, that a lot of places in natural orientations are going to continue to be heavily used by travelers. Hi Clayton, I'm Donna Basham, and I'm standing in front of America's Bridge in Canyon City, Colorado. Can you tell me what the future of bus tour business in Colorado looks like, both from domestic and international sources? Hey, how's it going Donna? That's a little too perfectly staged a question. <laughs> Beautiful up there. Um, I, I will say I think international tour bus and domestic tour bus is a little bit more problematic. I think until there's a vaccine or very rapid testing, 
it will be harder for the cruise line industry, the attractions industry, amusement parks, et cetera, and tour bus to affect an immediate change. People want to be in their cars and they want to control their own travel for now. But we do think by spring we're going to continue to see, or we will start to see an upsurge in tours generally and in tour bus as well. Hi, my name is Mason Barrows and I am a Colorado Mesa University student and an intern at Visit Grand Junction. I'm currently standing in front of the beautiful Colorado National Monument and our question for you is do you think that culinary travel is a primary motivator for consumers or has COVID-19 changed that? Thanks. You know, I do, I do think that culinary travel is challenging right now just because the reduced capacities and having high-end restaurant experiences or really any kind of culinary experience is more difficult. But there's no doubt in our research and what travelers tell us that the culinary experience and specifically immersive experiences around culinary is crucial for destinations and restaurants to, to promote. So we absolutely believe that's going to continue to be a crucial element. Hi, I'm Marilee Johnson with Logan County Tourism. I'm here in Sterling's quaint town square in front of the historical Logan County Courthouse. My question is, what is the single biggest tip you have for smaller destinations to take advantage of during this desire for less crowded destinations? Marilee, I think it's a really good point. So first, we know that smaller communities, especially rural communities that are along major thoroughfares and within drive distance, three to 400 miles of source markets are getting a heightened interest. So you're well positioned in that way. I also think that historical tourism and the types of travel products that smaller destinations can provide are gonna be more in demand in the next six months. So by dip, tipping into the Colorado Tourism Co-op programs, that really allows you to piggyback on what the tourism office is doing and then feature your destination in particular for those travelers. Hello Clayton, Matt Morgan here from the Sweet Basil and Mountain Standard Restaurants in Vail, Colorado. Currently standing out here in front of Sweet Basil right in the heart of the Vail Village. We've had a great summer here so far. Lots of people coming out to enjoy the plentiful outdoor dining, clean, fresh air, and all the other wonderful things we have to offer here in Vail and in our county. As you might imagine, people seem to be staying closer to home this summer, and most of our guests who are noticing are coming from drive markets, either the Front Range in Denver, other parts of the state, or neighboring states nearby. Hey Matt, uh, was just up in Vail. You know Sweet Basil is one of my favorite restaurants on earth. Thanks for the question. Um, no doubt that the Front Range in Colorado is fueling a lot of the outdoor dining in mountain communities. Um, it is not the long haul flyer that's coming in at the moment. And we do think as people begin to broaden their travel schemes and move into uh, air travel, that obviously they'll be coming into wide open spaces again. And we do think that begins to happen in the fall. This stretch season for us with the inducements that the airlines are offering, we think into Denver will provide more than just the front range as a source of business moving into winter and moving into the ski season. Greetings from the United States Olympic and Paralympic Museum here in beautiful downtown Colorado Springs. How much pent up travel demand do you expect for the late fall and winter season? Hi Michaela, I know the museum's just opened. I cannot wait to see it. Uh, thanks for the question. As I mentioned in our presentation, we think the stretch season is a real thing. Uh, summer demand that was not fulfilled because of the narrative around the virus that's moving into fall. And we do think that people will travel a lot more in the fall. In fact, in our study, 52% uh, of our respondents say they'll travel more in the fall of 20 than they did in the fall of 19, which is a really good sign for destinations like Colorado Springs and for your museum. Hello, I'm Pam Denehy, Director of Tourism for the City of La Junta. I'm here in La Junta at Ben's Old Fort National Historic Site, a reconstructed 1840s adobe fur trading post on the Santa Fe Trail. Ben's Fort is our most visited tourist attraction in Southeast Colorado. Clayton, is the move to more road trips today a trend that will continue? And will it attract a new traveler type to Colorado? That was actually really interesting, Pam, because in our data before COVID, we were seeing people say that they want to try new and different destinations anyway and historical destinations were at the top of that list. Combine that with the fact that an aging traveler, especially in the United States, is increasingly want to do, do that in their car. So I think that's a perfect combination for historic destinations and places like La Junta where people want to see new and different things. Hi, this is Virginia McNellis from Snowmass Tourism. I'm here in beautiful Snowmass Village. We wish you were here with us right now, but we'll see you next year. My question for this session is, should we invest more in marketing during a recession? Let me know your thoughts. 
Thanks, Virginia. I think, um, first of all, wealthy travelers, because of where the stock market is today and because of this, as I mentioned in my presentation, bifurcated recovery means very good things for Aspen Snowmass. We're telling all of our clients, even those that aren't getting the volumes they're traditionally using, uh, used to, to, to continue invest in marketing. Brands have to be perpetuated over time. So you can't just stop marketing, even if your travel volumes aren't the same as they would otherwise be. Travelers are gonna start making decisions even for trips six and 12 months from now, and you have to be exposed in the market to be sure you'll get your share. Well, thanks again for all the questions. Uh, this is a really fun day for me. Uh, I know it was virtual, but at least it wasn't in a room with a fake background. Thanks again to Rob Perlman, everybody with Steamboat for allowing this to happen. Really enjoy being invited. Uh, Kathy, thank you to you and the Colorado Tourism team. And just to be here in Steamboat to do this was really a thrill. The questions we got were great. I hope that this was somewhat entertaining. We probably maybe made some mistakes along the way, but it was fun nonetheless. And I hope everybody has a great day. I'll look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. Thanks. Thank you.